Okay, welcome everyone to my continuation of what is algebra. Today I would like to tell you something about the concept of a group. So what is a group? Um, it's a little bit of a mysterious thing if you see it for the first time. And today I would like to explain that it actually comes up very naturally uh, if you think about symmetries. So kind of the definition of a group in the end will turn out to be kind of an abstract version of a symmetry. And I will make precise what I mean by a symmetry and give you a lot of examples and motivation for the general definition, which is then the starting point for further studying of groups, which then includes studying of symmetries. And nobody would doubt that symmetries are something very important. So symmetries turn up well in arts, in, in physics, in, in nature, and so on. So uh, a, a good solid foundation in mathematics to study symmetries. That's something people really, really want and something we should really aim to get. And the theory of groups is a good start. So let's just jump right into it. Um, so kind of what I would like to explain is the, different of, uh, the difference between two, two concepts. So you can either think abstractly or you can think concretely in examples. It's kind of the same thing, but um, different flavor. And usually if you see a group for the first time, it's in the abstract flavor, which I will show you, because I'll also show you, but I will more, lay more emphasis on the um, explicit flavor, which is the, the right-hand side of my table. I'm going to explain in a second, um, because that's kind of how you should think about a group. Um, certainly having an abstract framework is really powerful. You can derive what are proposition theorems, statements about groups, about symmetries, without worrying too much where they come from. But having the right intuition um, usually boils down to kind of having the kind of a, a good picture of what is happening instead of having an abstract picture. And the way I would like you to think about it, or at least how I think about it, is as follows. So let's start with something all of you know, numbers. Okay. So um, there are two ways to, to look at numbers. You can, you can look at numbers as just being an abstract object, like three, right? Just, just what it is, number three. And all of you are super familiar by now with that. But actually, the first time you understood numbers was, was it very, very different. And um, I'm pretty sure about that because um, this is also how animals, for example, perceive numbers. Animals other than humans, humans are also animals. Anyway, um, this is how, so you can, you can, you can um, observe ravens or so. They, they can also, um, they also know what a number is. They probably don't have an abstract concept of a number. We don't know, but they certainly can see the number three as in, in this incarnation, like three apples or three whatever, right? So the number three comes in two different flavors, abstract one, which is, as all of you know, very, very useful, like in, in everyday life or in mathematics anyway, but it also comes in a, in a concrete incarnation, an explicit incarnation. And secretly, that's probably how you still think about numbers, at least how I probably still think about numbers. Numbers are concrete objects, although in mathematics, you usually work with them in an abstract way. And groups are kind of the same. So in mathematics, there will be some abstract definition. So here's an example of a symmetric group in four generators. It could be an abstract definition of the symmetric group in four generators. It doesn't really matter what it is. You will see it later. Um, but basically what it, what it means is you write down some abstract definition, you write down the multiplication table, some abstract symbols and some rules how to compose symbols. But in practice, actually what the symmetric group in four letters in this case is, it arises as a symmetry of an object. In this case, a symmetry of a tetrahedron. I will explain in a second what I mean by a symmetry of something, but basically it's, these are so geometric operations you can perform on objects. And in that sense, group theory is really aiming to generalize or formalize kind of symmetries in terms of mathematics. Okay, let's have a look at an example of what a symmetry actually is. So here you have um, the abstract 
definition of the circular group with three elements, which can identify with Z mod three if you want, but you don't need to. So you can abstractly just define it by a multiplication table, which I'm going to explain in a second. And here you have a concrete incarnation, which I'm also going to explain in a second. So in the multiplication table, you have three elements, a green one, um, and a red one, which I call G, and a purple one, which I call H, whatever. And this table tells you how to compose them. So example, G times H, is the identity which you can see, for example, G times H is the identity up here. Okay, so that's a completely legal definition of a group. That's what you would do abstractly. It's given by a multiplication table, by a rule how to compose elements. Basically, that's what it is. Um, but explicitly, it's given as follows. So I, I take a certain geometric object. So I took here uh, a street sign. And this street sign, if you just look at it, it seems to have a symmetry, right? There's a certain symmetry in the street sign. And I claim that this is a rotational symmetry uh, um, just given by the group Z mod, so the group here above, above here. So the simply group with, with three elements. And how do we see this? Well, um, so what is actually a symmetry of this object? A symmetry of this object is an operation, well, that, well, let's say I close my eyes and you are allowed to do something to that object, whatever it is. And then I reopen my eyes and I haven't seen any difference. That's the symmetry of the object, okay? Um, you will see examples in a second or will explain the examples you already see in a second. So I say it again. So there is an object and it has a symmetry X. If, if I close my eyes, you perform X and I open my eyes, then I can't tell the difference. In particular, in this case, I claim there are three symmetries that you could perform, at least three symmetries on this object, rotational symmetries on this object that you could perform. Um, so what you can do is you can wrote, you can do nothing. Okay, that's always confusing. Operation X is to be allowed. I close my eyes, you do absolutely nothing. I open my eyes and of course I can't tell the difference. So in order to highlight that, um, I highlighted one of those arrows and you will see the difference after the operation on the other side. So this arrow is always highlighted and these are the operations. So the, the, the one operation is the do nothing operation. It just does, well, nothing. So you, you haven't done anything. The G operation is a, is a rotation by a certain angle. You can see it here. So this guy goes to here. And the H operation is, not, is a rotation by a further angle. And the only reason I, I this is important, the only reason why I highlight um, this one arrow is now I have broken the symmetry actually. So this highlighted uh, street sign doesn't have those symmetries anymore, except the first one, of course, because I can tell now the difference if I look at, at, at this picture, right? Um, but this is only for illustration purposes. So actually, I'm looking at the symmetry of this guy. And without, um, without having one arrow highlighted, I, I couldn't tell the difference, right? So um, the way to illustrate symmetries is a little bit different than the way how to define symmetries. You would define symmetries, I say it again, I close my eyes, you do something, I open my eyes, I can't tell the difference. That's really bad for illustrations because then you would just write down always the same picture. Um, so in illustrations, I tend to highlight uh, certain certain parts of the of, of the object I would like to study in symmetry, and then I, I see the operation, right? So this tells me how the operation looks like. Anyway, so this is a group. So is are defined abstractly by just a combinatorial rule. Here's a rule. This is how you do it. Or let's say geometrically by looking at street signs. I think this is a street sign from Finland looking at street signs from uh, Finland. Here's another one. So let's, let's try to push it a little bit further. So down here, I've highlighted the symmetries. So there are 12, 12 of the regular um, hexagon. So the background picture, this guy in the background. And as before, I, will, I illustrate the symmetries by, by, putting, by highlighting something which actually isn't there. 
So the symmetry itself is a is the symmetry of the of, of the background of the regular hexagon. And as you can see, for, for all 12 of them, the picture would be the same if I would ignore my highlighting symbol in the middle. And the highlighting symbol I have in the middle is something that is not symmetric under the operations I can perform on the hexagon, so I can see the difference. The easy one is a do nothing operation. So um, you do nothing, sure, then, then the object stays, the highlighted object stays itself, this F here, of course it stays itself, or then there's a rotation. And the first of the 60 degrees in this case, I call it R. And the first observation you would make is, hmm, okay, uh, multiplication, this, this, um, um, the symmetries actually can be composed. So I have a rotation by 60 degrees and I can rotate it again by another 60 degrees, which is a rotation by 120 degrees, which I denote by R, R, right? It's R squared. I do R twice. I just don't write R squared. Uh, R cubed, R to the fourth, R to the fifth, and then, you, then you're back where you started, right? It's just the composition of, of uh, those operations. So if you would like to formalize symmetries, what we should do is this one. We should say, okay, there is a composition rule of symmetries. If I have one symmetry, I have another symmetry, then I get a third symmetry. Here, I did just a very easy thing. I had one symmetry, which was a 60 degree rotation. And I applied it all over, again and again and again. But of course, you can now think of uh, whatever, composing this one with this one to get this one. Uh, of course, not this one, it was very stupid, you to get this one, right? Three times R plus an R is four times R. So we check that. Um, the second thing that's pretty obvious from the picture is that this, is, this is operation is associative. Uh, in the geometric in, ge in the geometric picture, there's absolutely nothing to say about that. It's completely clear, uh, but you need to add this for the abstract definition because, as I said, abstract definition means I give you a set of rules that you would apply. Um, the other observation, which I already stressed a few times, is that you have this unit. You have this do nothing operation. Here you go, the do nothing operation. Totally fine. I close my eyes, you do nothing. I open my eyes, no change. And something we haven't seen, well, I haven't stressed is the inverse operation. So the inverse operation is, well, if I've rotated 60 degrees, I can also anti-rotate 60 degrees. So this operation and this operation are invertible in the sense that I go back to do nothing. And that's a really pretty strong property you, you have on, on symmetries. Whenever you do something, you can undo that, okay? Whenever you do something, you can undo that. Life is much more complicated. You can't undo your actions in life most of the time. Um, but for groups, it's fine. You can undo what you have done, okay? And in practice, by the way, this means um, that in multiplication tables for groups, you will see in each row, in each column, you will see exactly uh, do you have no repetitions? You see exactly every element appear once. So G H one H one G one G H, for example. This is a consequence of having an invert, an, in, an undo operation, an inversion. Um, and the formal terminology is inversion. Um, so there are other symmetries. There's a reflection symmetry. So here you go, and then compositions. And it's in this case not not hard to see that this is all you can do to a hexagon. So the symmetry group of the hexagon has 12 elements. Beware, I warn you that in general, um, GH is not equal to HG, which is the only thing that is kind of different from, from, from numbers here, right? You could think of numbers, I could give the example in a second, but you can think of numbers as being a group. Let's say integers with addition is a group. The difference is, in general, you don't have commutativity. You don't have GH equals, equals HG. We can see this here explicitly. So first R and then S is this element. I highlighted it as first R and then S. And it would do the following. You, 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 you could see it, right? You, you first turn, and then you re reflect. You end up here. And this is not the same as first reflecting and um, uh, 
uh, then rotating because this is this element. Okay, and those two are not the same. Not as you can see, because my f is in a different position. So the only only thing that is really different here from from classical whatever calculations with numbers is that you need to be careful that you don't have commutativity in general. You could have it in some examples, but in general, you just don't. Just keep that in mind. But anyway, so what we have just derived by looking at the symmetries of a, a regular hexagon is that if we want to formalize symmetries, then we would like to have a multiplication that satisfies associativity, unitality, this is called unitality, in that every uh, element is inver invertible. And that's exactly what you do. It's exactly what you do. A group is a set together as an operation satisfying uh, associativity unit and invertibility. And that's pretty good because now examples of groups immediately include symmetries of things, whatever things are, like regular polytops, or I'll show you some more symmetries in a second. Um, they include permutation groups, SN, symmetric groups or permutation groups, so same name for the, a different name for the same beast. Things like alternating groups, which you might have seen, if not, you can ignore them. They in, include the cyclic groups, which we've just seen as rotation groups. But they also include more abstract things that are not necessarily associated to the symmetry of an object a priori, like um, you could have the integers with composition being addition, or you can do something like um, uh, the rational numbers with composition being multiplication. Well, you might complain now zero, zero times zero is zero times something is never one. So you take out zero, but then you're fine because, well, uh, whatever, A over B has an inverse, which is B over A, which is always one. And for that, you certainly don't want A to be zero, right? So you take out zero and then composition and multiplication. And the whole point is now that you have an abstract definition which captures all those examples. And the abstract definition is motivated by studying symmetry. I think that's pretty cool. So let me um, end with the probably the most famous symmetry groups, the symmetry groups of the platonic solids. If you don't know what a platonic solid is, here they are. There are five. They are uh, the five interesting dice you usually see in what kind of game you want to play involving dice. So there is uh, the tetrahedron. This is this one. There is the cube. Which is this one, there's an octahedron, which is this one, there's a dodecahedron with uh, 12 sides, and there is a, so this number here is the number of sides, uh, except here, because here the, 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 the pointy each, uh, the pointy vertex is, is pointing upwards, so the face is pointing downwards actually, so this is four faces, let me just write it here for six faces, eight faces, 12 faces, 20 faces, the last one is called isocahedron. And the symmetry groups of this guy, those guys are well known. I've listed them here. Don't lo look at it too closely or stop the video if you want to look like, like to look at it too closely. It's not so important. I will show it to you in action actually how it looks like. So I would like to um, show to you how this thing works, whether we can find the S4 here because uh, without reflections or well, you could think about it for a second, it's not so hard. Without reflections, all symmetries are actually rotations. So let's see whether we can find something like S4 um, in, in, in the corresponding symmetry groups. Okay, so here is my illustration. Um, we have a tetrahedron, we have a cube, so the platonic solids. We have the octahedron, which I'm going to show you. We have the dodecahedron, which takes a while to load. We have the isocahedron, which also takes a while to load. Let's go to the octahedron. So this is the octahedron. And I've chosen the rotation angle um, that you can see here. So let's, let's see what it does. So I rotate the angle. And the nice thing is here, so I see, as you can see, I can't do a, any angle I want because now I could tell the difference, right? So the, the original one is, of course, this kind of spine in the background. So I can't do all angles, but at one point, it will work out here. It's the same, but now 
I, I can't tell the difference, but strictly speaking, the point at the top is now at the bottom block. So this is an operation which if you do it once more, it goes back to itself. So here you have a D um, and that's called order two. So the order of an element is how often you apply it to itself until you get back to where you started. So this is an order two operation. If you see this, uh, doesn't fit, doesn't fit, doesn't fit, doesn't fit, fits. Doesn't fit, doesn't fit, doesn't fit, doesn't fit, doesn't fit, doesn't fit, 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 fits. And the point is back to where it started. So this was an order two rotation. So let's go to a different, uh, so now the, the rotation axis is, is, is here. So it's different from before. So let's do the same trick. So we rotate, we rotate, we rotate, we rotate, we rotate. Oh, it clicks in. Ah, but it's not still back to where it started because um, the one where I started is now pointing into, the, into your screen. So let's continue. And here it clicks again. The starting point is now pointing downwards. Here it clicks again, the starting point is now pointing towards you. And tuck, we are back to where we started. So this was an order four operation. Let's count again. One, two, three, back, four. And similarly, there is an order three operation, which is another rotation axis. Uh, let's see. So we rotate, we rotate, we rotate, eight points. Now the starting point is pointing to your uh, roughly towards you. It's um, what is it? Basically east, a little bit southeast. Let's do it again. Well, it points southeast, but the object itself looks looks the same, right? So this was a symmetry. We could do this once more. Now it's po pointing towards you, but the object looks the same, and we do it once more, and we do backward to where we started. So this was a degree. An order three, uh, three operation. Let's have a look. One, two, and three. And basically, what I just showed you is the symmetric group S4. There was an order two operation, there was an order three operation, and there was an order four operation. Um, the crucial point is now to prove that these are all rotations, but uh, these are all symmetries, all rotational symmetries. Um, that's not hard, but certainly a bit trickier than to just to observe that these are. Okay, um, and in a very similar way, you can compute, uh, you can actually use, uh, at least for the rotational ones, a Mathematica notebook that is linked in the description to determine the rotational, so this one, A4 and A5 for the dodecahedron and isocahedron, respectively, for the tetrahedron, or the other way around, for the tetrahedron, respectively, the dodecahedron and isocahedron. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about groups for today. So groups are just an abstract version of symmetries. That's about it. And of course, if you just think of symmetries, of course, this is important in mathematics and beyond. Um, yeah, so just keep that in mind. And well, I hope to see you next time.